into the word of God. So we just want to thank our Lord and God for all that he's done for us, for giving us this word that we can study it and learn more about him because Jesus said we do error not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. So we like to talk about Jesus because Jesus has done everything for us. And the title of the lesson today is, it's when Jesus says in the 15th chapter of John, he says, I have called you friends. So Jesus says that we can be his friend. And to me, that's the most exciting thing in the world to know that Jesus is my best friend because I take Jesus everywhere I go. When my feet hit the floor in the morning, it's about Jesus. When I lay down at nighttime, it's about Jesus. And of course, all day long, it is about Jesus. And like I say every week, I get to have more fun than most people do because wherever I go, I take Jesus right on along. And when I get in the big truck in the morning, praise and worship's on, the prayers are already said, and it's me and Jesus heading down the highway. So we have lots of fun. We, have a, we got a few testimonies a little bit later on because we always like to talk about what God's doing in this exciting world that we're passing through because we're on our way. We're on our way to the celestial kingdom, aren't we? We're on our way to a place called heaven. And Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many, many mansions. And he said, if I go, I will prepare a place for you. So we know that Jesus is in heaven waiting for us to get there. But we got work to do on this side of heaven, don't we? We got souls to win. We got people to tell about Jesus. And we got to let them know that Jesus wants to be their friend. When you're witnessing to somebody, if you ask them, is Jesus your friend? You know, it makes them think, is Jesus really their best friend? But in the 15th chapter of John, Jesus told the disciples, he said, I want to call you my friend. And it's very, very important. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, it's very, very important that Jesus does refer to us as his friends. But we have to analyze a little bit about what Jesus is. You got to realize that Jesus would be the perfect friend for us, wouldn't he? Because he always talked about the Father's will, didn't he? He always wanted to let the disciples and the people that he was teaching, he wanted to let them know that you must be about my father's business. And Jesus was the example of love. Now here in, in at the church at Jesus as Lord Ministries, we've been studying about love. And Pastor Mike's been doing a tremendous job of teaching us about the love of God and about all that, uh, thank you, Levi, about all that God has done for us because Jesus was the example of, by going to the cross, he was obedient to the Father, wasn't he? That he shed his blood so that you and me might have salvation. Jesus shed his blood that our sins could be washed away so that we would be put back in fellowship with God Almighty and that we could walk and talk with Jesus all the day long. So we see that Jesus is the example that we need to follow. And, you know, Jesus chose to live a crucified life, didn't he? He crucified his flesh because the Bible says that he was tempted, <clears throat> excuse me, he was tempted in all like manner the same way we did. So we know that Jesus lived the crucified life because Jesus could have maybe not obeyed God, but we know that Jesus lived a sinless life, didn't he? And he lived that crucified life. So that we learn from Jesus that if he's going to be our best friend, the question is, are you Jesus' best friend? Are you Jesus' best friend? So let's look, take a look here in the 15th chapter of John. We're going to start with the 12th verse. And Jesus writes, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Verse 13, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Verse 14 says, Ye are my friends, and if you, do, if you do whatever I command you. And the word here, command, means just simply obey. Jesus says, it, the, the, the King James Version uses the word command, and it's simply a love command. It's, a, it's, it's just a love order that if you love me, you're going to do what's in my commandments. Verse 15, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doth, 
But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Well, to me, this is a very powerful set of, of scriptures because Jesus is revealing that everything that the Father in heaven has told Jesus, Jesus says, I've passed it on to you guys so that you can go forth and win the world to seek and to save that which is lost. So as we read that, that set of verses, in the, um, in the verse it says here that, that, that it talks about this is my commandment that you love one another. See, because we love God, he calls us his friends. Jesus saw the fruit in their life. Now, what if Jesus didn't see any fruit in their life? Would he have still called them friends? Probably not. But Jesus very specially chose the disciples, didn't he? And he was looking for the fruit. And once he's seen the fruit in their life, he says, you're my friends. You're no longer a servant. Because, see, they proved their love to God, didn't they? They was faithful to Jesus. You know, <clears throat> and um, at our house, we really enjoy watching The Chosen because it's kind of a, a show that reveals the, the daily life of Jesus and the disciples and, and all the crowds around him. And we see the love of God and the compassion of Jesus pouring out. You know, some, some, some of the, the, the more favorite stories that we have are, is when Jesus walks up to the, <clears throat> the young man at the, uh, well, he wasn't a young man because he was lame for 38 years, but he walks up to the pool to the man that was laying there for 38 years, and he says, would you like to be healed? And of course, the man starts saying, well, there's nobody to put me in the water and all that. But Jesus reveals, that's not the question I ask you. I ask you, would you like to be made whole or would you like to be healed? Well, to me, these, is, these stories are so exciting because Jesus is a, is a living part of my life. This, to me, is Jesus just walking around the neighborhood and he sees somebody that's lame, and he just reaches down, or he looks at him. He says, rise, take up your bed, and walk, didn't he? And the man immediately started to feel his legs, didn't he? And he noticed that he had feelings in his legs, and he jumps up, and he takes his bed, and he leaves. But that's the Jesus that we serve. That's the Jesus that is real to us. Jesus wants to be your best friend. He wants to go with you. And another favorite story of mine is, is, the, is the story of the woman at the well. And the lady comes to draw water. And, of course, Jesus asked for a drink of water, didn't he? And they got in a little bit of a conversation there. And Jesus revealed a few things. But what blesses my heart most about that story is that that triggered a two-day revival in Samaria. They wasn't planning on having a revival, but because Jesus was there, they was going to have a revival, wasn't they? Because God Almighty was on the scene. And this same Jesus lives inside of you and me. Because the word says that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. So we see that the greater one, if he really, really, truly lives inside of you. But you see, we always confess, and I make sure that I bring it out every time, Romans 10, 9, 10, that if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, he must be Lord, right? And believe in your heart. See, so many preachers leave it out. They say, if you confess Jesus, you'll be saved. But the Bible very clearly says that you must confess Jesus with your mouth as, mouth as the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart. How many people you know that say that they believe something but they have no fruit. And that's what I want to bring out in this set of scriptures here, that Jesus told the disciples, you're no longer servants, but you are my friend. And because they believed in their heart, Jesus perceived their heart, didn't he? And he knew what they were thinking, what they were believing, just like the woman at the well, he knew everything she was thinking and everything she did because God Almighty knows everything, doesn't he? He's watching us, and he says that you must believe in your heart. And here lies the compassion that I have <clears throat> for humanity because it's just like um, when, you, when you quote the verse, whoever shall say to the mountain, Mark 11, 23 and 24, 
Whosoever shall say to the mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, right? Then he shall have whatsoever things he saith. But it's very, very important because the Bible continuously mentions our heart, doesn't it? But how many believers do you know that they'll get sick and they'll confess scriptures, they're confessing them with their mouth, but they're not believing with their heart. And unfortunately, there's some that go home to be with the Lord simply because they're confessing it with their mouth and not believing in their heart. So please encourage when you hear a Christian and they're praying, make sure that they've heard from heaven. Make sure that they're walking by faith because faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. But remember, it's about the heart because what does Romans 10, 10 say? That with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, but with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Man believes with his heart unto righteousness. God Almighty sees the fruit that's in your life. And he's looking for that fruit because he's looking to say, you're no longer a servant. Now you are my friend. Because Jesus knows, doesn't he? And it's very, very important that Jesus sees fruit in our life. You know, the Bible says in the, in the book of Isaiah that we should set our face like a flint. A flint is a very hard piece of substance that can't be changed or, or, or compromised very easy. But Isaiah said, set your face like a flint. The Apostle Paul said that we should run this race on this earth, that we should set our sight on the goal line and run with everything we have to compete in this race in life, to make sure that we're very fervent about everything that we say and do. Well, you know, the other day I was, I was <clears throat> down on my eastern shores, I call it my eastern shores. I drive down there every day. Well, not every day, every couple of days. But anyway, now the corn that I told you about that, that came up in three or four days that was about six inches high because I seen a little Monday to come back on Friday and it's over to grow. It's as tall as I am now. Now it's got two great big ears of corn on it, and it's absolutely beautiful. Now, we know that Jesus said that in Mark chapter 4, that if you understand the power of the sower, you'll understand the whole kingdom of heaven. So, now I'm always fascinated with the word of God. So now all the corn, thousands and thousands of acres of corn are as tall as I am. They, I looked at them. They all got two ears of corn on them. But this is hard to understand. There's a little 20-foot area. It's round, about 20 feet long. And the corn is only about a foot high. Now, what happened? It's the exact same seed. And the seed, the Bible says, is what? The Word of God, isn't it? So we know that the Word of God can never fail because the Word never returns void. So we know in this cornfield that it wasn't the seed because it's all the same seed. It couldn't be the soil because when that big tractor plows and discs and does everything, they're dragging that soil everywhere. To, so probably can't be the soil. So we have to say what happened to that corn that it only got a foot tall when everybody else is as tall as I am. It's six foot tall. So you have to, you know, I said, Lord, you got to explain this in here to me. And like I say, the Lord says it's very simple. It's the elements around the corn. It's not the soil. It's not the seed. It's the elements that the seed and the soil is in. So, for instance, if you would um, put the word of God in your heart, you've made sure that the condition of your heart is pure, is honest, it, it's got integrity, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really good soil because you have cultivated it, you have planted the word of God in your heart, and you've made sure that you've got good productive soil so that it's conducive to grow this seed. But what happens if you take that seed and put it in a bad... Let's say when you get off work, you decide you're going to hang out with some bad people, and they're naysayers, and they're unbelievers, and they don't believe in God. And you tell them your testimony, how God healed you, how God set you free, how Jesus went to the cross, and, and they mock and they make fun of Jesus and everything. You're not 
causing a conducive element for your faith, for your seed to grow in. You know, another good example is the fact that suppose, because I know people that do this, they read their Bible a lot. They read their Bible. Now, most of them will tell you that they can't understand it because they read it and they read it and read it, and all they're doing is reading it. And that you can live at home, sitting at home, reading your Bible, listening to teaching, watching preachers on TV, and if you're not doing what Jesus said, Jesus said, go into the where? The harvest field. He said, go into the highways, go into the byway. The disciples one time said, Jesus, increase our faith. Jesus said, go out and use it. Go pray for the sick. They'll get healed. You'll see. And then it's just like David. David used his faith on the bear, on the lion, on Goliath, and David's faith grew, didn't it? So we have to use our faith or it becomes stagnant, doesn't it? So this little corn couldn't grow because of the elements around it. So we have to very, very, very cautiously be careful where, who, what, who you're running with, where you're hanging out with. If I get off work and go to the bar every night and get drunk, uh, that's not a very conducive uh, environment for the Word of God. It's not good soul. And believe it or not, the seeds that I would plant in my heart would not produce the way God says they would produce. Because the parable of the sower says that you're going you're to receive a harvest for that. But Jesus very, very specifically here said to the, to the disciples, you're no longer servants, but you are a child of, of mine. You know, in the same line that uh, I didn't even get a chance to tell my wife this story because you, usually we're, we're, we're busy either studying the word or tending to children and grandchildren, and we have fun at everything we do. But uh, I was coming home from work the other day, and uh, I, have, I come home Route 15, so there's two lanes coming north and two lanes going south. Well, I was heading south, and there was about 12 to 13 of these great big Canadian geese came out on the other side of the road and was walking across 15. Well, most people don't like to hit an animal with their vehicle for two reasons. One, you don't want to bust your car all up. And number two is, you know, they don't like to you know, be inhumane to animals. So I've, it, it, almost, it, it did scare me because I almost pulled off the side of the road because the cars that were going, I'd say, 70 mile an hour on 15 North, they slammed the brakes on. Well, there was tractor and trailers behind them. They had to slam the brakes on and swerve out right around the cars. There was motorcycles behind. They had to go off the side of the road. Now, nobody wrecked that I could see, right? But here comes these geese. These, these 12 geese were just walking across on their pace right across 15, and, and they came on across. And, and these it fit, traffic stopped. It stopped dead on 15. And I begin to pile up. And uh, so I'm thinking, oh, I don't see anybody wrecked. So I, I proceeded on south, and I watched these uh, these uh, geese continue to come across there. But after they got across that northbound lane, they went across the grass strip. Now they have to cross the southbound lane with the same traffic in the same, for instance, right? So I went down the road and, and uh, had some things to do. Then I had to go back, back up the road there. Well, sure enough, on my way back up the road, there was one dead goose laying in the northbound lane, right? And when I went up, town and it came back down there was one dead goose laying in the southbound lane now you know when you stay in tune with jesus all the time you not that you want to spiritualize everything but i said lord i said what's going on and of course the lord said donnie it's just like my people i give them the word of god and they don't want the word of god they don't want to listen to the Word of God. They don't want to follow God's commandments. I have people call me up and ask me to pray for them. I said, well, you can, you can pray for yourself. No, no, I, I, I don't pray. I, I want you to pray for me. And they'll, they'll say, well, can you pray for a family member? It's like, you can go before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and ask him your petition. Ask him into your heart. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, he will more than gladly open the windows of heaven and come into your heart. But remember, you have to ask. It's a free gift 
Salvation's free. You don't have to do a thing for it. Jesus already went to that cross, didn't he? Jesus already shed his blood. Jesus did everything for us. Salvation is free. It's a gift from heaven above. So these people ask, you know, for prayer and things like that. But these geese could have flew across 15, couldn't they? They could have simply come across the field when they got to 15. They could have flapped their little wings. They could have flew across 15, and not one of them would have got hurt. And, you know, I watch a lot of geese. They don't put any effort at all. They just flap their wings, and, and up they go. And they could have been across 15. But it's just like God's people. God says in 2 Peter 2.24 that by the stripes of Jesus were healed. Very simple concept. You go before your Father, you pre present your petition, and Jesus says, this is my word, believe me. Isaiah 53 says the same thing, that Jesus bore our sins on that cross, and he healed us from our sicknesses and diseases. God says he'll give you peace. God says he'll give you rest. God says he'll be with you. God says if you ask anything in my name, I will give it to you according to my will. God says he provides all of our needs, all of our needs. Most of the time, you don't even have to ask because God has already promised you your needs will be met. But occasionally we have a need and we, and, and, and we just mention it to God, say, hey, you know, Lord, I got this need. I got this unexpected bill. The car broke down. I need a little bit of this, a little bit of finances here. I need a blessing. But God Almighty already knows what we have need of. He just wants us to ask him, doesn't he? He wants us to have the, uh, that, that time with him. So these geese could have flew across 15, but they didn't. We as Christians can fly like an eagle, the Bible says. We'll soar like the eagles, doesn't it? It says we will rise up like the eagles and fly. All we have to do is ask God Almighty. Well, you know, um, this has been a, a little while back now, but we have prayer here at the church, and, and one day I was up front here, and a young man come up for prayer, and of all things, his wife had just died from cancer. So I said to the brother, I said, well, what can I do for you? He said, I want God to do something. I, I want God to do something. My wife died of cancer. He said, I, I, I don't know why she died from cancer, I, you know, and to me, it's very important. And I asked the young man, I said, was, was your wife born again? He said, yes, she was born again. She knew the Lord Jesus as her, as her Savior. I said, well, brother, I said, I'm glad to hear that because I said, she is in the arms of Jesus in heaven. This young man got so violently mad that I said that his wife, he said, he screamed. He said, that's not what I want to hear. I don't want to hear anything about my wife being, he said, I want my wife back. And this young man wanted his wife back so bad that he became, he clenched both fists. And I actually thought he was going to hit me, but he, he didn't hit me because immediately, because, you know, the Bible says that we are full of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom if, if you ask him. And of course, you know, God always provides so as this young man became so angry at God Almighty because God, he says God left his wife die, I had to explain to him, number one, <clears throat> that Jesus gave us the word of God, didn't he? And the Bible says in John chapter 10, 10, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. I explained to the young man, I said, son, you got the anger in the wrong spot. You don't need to be angry at God because God Almighty is 100% love. God is your friend. God is for you. He's not against you. And I explained to the young man that the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The devil gave his wife cancer. The devil caused his wife to die. The devil is the accuser of every brother that has ever confessed the name of Jesus. And what this young man needs to do is he needs to get the word of God in his heart. Now, it's obvious that, you know, that he loves God. He believes in God. He, you know, I, I never got a chance to ask him if Jesus was the Lord of his life. But, uh, 
because you know he had this anger issue going on there right then, but and rightfully so. He just had the anger pointed in the wrong. He was pointing it towards God, and he needed to point it towards the devil. He needs to get it in the right place. But always remember that the thief is the one that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So if you lose something or somebody, it's not because of your heavenly Father. Your heavenly Father, the Lord God Almighty, is 100% love. He loves you so much that he laid down his life for you. So we got to remember that, um, that no matter what goes on, that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You know, um, in this set of passages, we, we see here that Jesus wants to be our friend. I want to flip back here real quick because we studied this lesson about a month or two ago. And it's actually, this is where, in the 15th chapter of John, is when Jesus talked about, <clears throat> about the disciples being servants and they're no longer servants, they're now friends. But the Apostle Paul in the fourth chapter of Galatians, the Apostle Paul always took the writings of Christ and kind of broke it down a little bit so that, so that we'd have a better understanding. But we've talked about this before, and it's very important that we understand in the fourth chapter, first verse, it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant. See, the same thing that Jesus said. He, Jesus talked about a servant. You're, you're not getting anything as a servant. You're not getting anything until you get some fruit on your tree. And uh, Jesus and the Apostle Paul said, differ nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. So you see, you can be a child of God. You can be a servant of God. And you're not getting anything yet until God sees that fruit. Verse number two says, but it's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. So you see, the disciples was under the tutoring of Jesus I don't know, three and a half, four years. We don't really know, but it was close to three and a half a year. So anyway, Jesus tutored these guys until he said, now you're no longer a servant, but now you are a friend. Verse number three, and it says, even so, when we, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of this world. Verse four says, but when the fullness of the time come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoptions of son. So you see here in this in Galatians, the apostle Paul is saying, you're no longer a servant. You are a friend of God. And that excites me because I'll tell you, there's nothing like being a friend of God. And yes, I managed to get my truck stuck in the field again the other day. I'm getting really good at this here because there's, the, every field has to have a drainage ditch in it. It's an EPA law. You have to maintain a drainage ditch in these fields so that the runoff water goes where the EPA wants it to go. So the rule of thumb is you don't run on a farmer's hay field. So we had this great big semi tractor and trailer. The other track, the other semi broke down, so we had to unhook this semi. So I backed, unhooked it from the trailer, and I backed, I'm backing around, so I'm not running on the guy's hay field. And sure enough, the back wheels come up off, up on the hump there. So the drive axle, it just sat there and just was just spinning. And it didn't have any weight on it because the, the back wheels took the weight off. But long story short, what do we always do? We call in the name of Jesus, say, Lord, once again, I need help because you don't want to have to call back and tell the boss you're stuck in the field. But anyway, this truck should have, it, it has the buttons on the, this truck actually had the buttons on the dash where you could lock the four-wheel drive and everything in. So I hit the four-wheel drive button, wouldn't work. Nothing, didn't lock, the wheels were still spinning. So through the process of, uh, meditating on the word, thanking God for the victory, et cetera, et cetera. I rocked, I backed up about a quarter of an inch, pulled up a quarter inch, and I hit the button again, and it clicked in, and the four-wheel drive worked, and out of the field we came, right? But, you know, it's always exciting that no matter what we go through, Jesus is always with us. He's never going to let you there. You know, Romans 8, 28, another one of my favorite verses all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Everything happens. And what's your response to that is how God Almighty 
determines the outcome of that, doesn't it? So, uh, you know, no matter what happens, just turn to the Word of God, cast all your care upon the Lord, and He'll, um, He'll provide for you every time. So, uh, I'm just going to look across my notes here all, all the time, but it's very, very important that we stay in the will of God, isn't it? That we stay right where Jesus wants us at. The will of God is so important for our lives. So, um, with that there being said, uh, I think we're going to wind it all down here real quick here because we went over Galatians chapter 4 that we're no longer servants, but we are Jesus' friends. It's very, very important for us to be friends with God Almighty. We're Jesus' best friend, and Jesus is our best friend. So with that being said, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and thank God for his word once again. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Father, you said that we were servants as long as we were under your tutoring. But Lord, you said it comes that day where you, could call, where you call us your friend. Father, we thank you so much that we can be friends with you, that you are our best friend and we're your best friend. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for the fellowship, for the relationship that we have, that we can just come to you no matter what's going on. And Father, we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.